many years ago, when I was a little boy back in Nigeria. Was I that little? I guess I was. I must have been around 12 or 13 years old at the time. Back then, I was that shy kid that pretty much kept to himself. However, I became friends with this other kid in my school. His name is not Ebikake. But for the purpose of this story, let us all agree that it is. Ibikake was a new boy joining us from another school, but we became fast friends, and I cannot now recall how exactly that came to be. I do remember, though, that we were classmates, and we had common interest in books, movies, and music. We hung out together in and sometimes out of school. My parents didn't let me go out much, but on Fridays, I could follow Ibikake home and spend a few hours playing games and visiting with him and his family. Since his parents permitted it, my parents were also fine with me spending a few hours in Ibikake's house once every week. Ibikake's parents were wealthy. They had a big house in one of the more affluent areas in the city we lived in at the time. They also had many fancy cars and his mother was a great cook. Believe it or not, I still remember the taste of an okra and a goosey soup combination. That combination is mine, by the way. And the smooth semovita that accompanied the culinary wizardry she served hot and ready every time I visited. For the food alone, I never missed my Friday after school visits with my new friend. Did I mention the big house? I think I did. What I may not have mentioned, though, was how beautiful and tastefully furnished their living room was. Apart from the rich draperies and soft leather seats in their living room, what caught my attention the most were the family portraits on the wall. The most imposing, enlarged, and framed family photo in the room was the one of his mother and father looking all rich and intimidating in their matching Swiss lace Nigerian outfits. Ebikake and his two younger brothers Tari and Seifa, dressed in black suits and red bow ties. They didn't look quite as intimidating as their parents, but maybe it was because I knew them and we played together. Anyway, that particular portrait was placed so anyone coming into the family room was struck by its size and the rich on it material that framed it. Anyone looking at that picture saw what the family intended for them to see and believe. Everyone in the frame looked confident, elegant, and happy. My visits to Ebikake's house continued for months. And then one day, maybe because I'd visited so often, they started seeing me as a part of the family, or perhaps they forgot I was still there because it was well past when I should have left. Whatever it was, they brought her out. They brought their sister out of the room that was always locked. The room they never let anyone into. That evening, I went home thinking about Ebikake's sister. I went home thinking about her and why they kept her hidden, why she wasn't in the frame. As I grew older and, be and became a writer, I began to see parallels between what my friends and his family did to that little girl and what a person might do while telling a story or writing a book. Just as it was with that picture in the frame that left out a family member because the others were ashamed of her disability, which had her stunted and in a vegetative state. In writing, we sometimes leave out certain people or experiences in order to tell the perfect story or version of history we weren't told or remembered. Just as those parents sacrificed their daughter because they didn't think she was good enough for the perfect picture they wanted framed and on display in their house, truth may be sacrificed for the version of events we want the world to hear or for political correctness. As it is with writing, so it is with immigration. In wanting to project the perfect picture of inclusion and multiculturalism, what stories and experiences are being suppressed? Who 
has been taken out of the frame. Do we need those frames? Does a photograph lose its value and aesthetics if it isn't in a frame? I don't know, I'm just asking. As a storyteller and a writer as well, I often ask myself, where is the story? Is the real story what is in the frame or the things not seen or captured in the frame? In the case of my friend Ebikake, is the story of their family the image of perfection of father, mother, and three children in the frame? It could be. But if we look beyond the frame, wouldn't we discover more? Good and bad, happy and sad, failures and triumphs, war and peace, and all the things that enrich our lives and make it truly complete. As I end this, I'd like you to do something really simple for me. If you will, can you take a minute and ask yourself this, in a journey to becoming, becoming happy, becoming a father, mother, husband, or wife, becoming the professional you are today, becoming you, becoming, becoming the Canada of our aspiration, who have we left out of the frame?